This is the Hagman and Hagman Report for today. It is Thursday, October 1st, 2015. We're coming to you live from the radio and television studios of the Hagman and Hagman Report, located here in beautiful northwest Pennsylvania at our regular time, 7 p.m. Eastern Time, as we do every Monday through Friday. We're proud to be broadcast on the Global Star Radio Network. We're also featured now, featured live on Blog Talk Radio Concurrent. That's right, concurrent with Global Star. Global Star, of course, is our flagship net network. And also, we're streaming live on YouTube. Oh, wait. I got the wrong image up there. Oh, boy. Hang on. This is almost as bad as the plug. Stand by. What'd you do? Oh. Oh, you got the desk. Uh, the, the camera's desk. pointing. Yeah, there's a... There, there's a loose camera here in the studios, and uh, I guess I can turn this on. I, I'm late. I'm, I'm late to the party. I ran down, uh, ran down to the uh, to get some coffee, and just made it back before airtime. I mean, ju just as the song was playing, I, and I made it to the desk. Anyway, uh, yeah, folks, I'm Doug Hagman, the Elm of Fellow Investigator Researcher, and most importantly, my son Joe Hagman. Together, we are the Hagman and Hagman Report. I want to welcome you to this episode, this edition of the Hagman and Hagman Report. So good to have you with us. My goodness. Um, you know, it's our job to bring you the news behind the news, the uh, headlines that, uh, uh, well, that's shaping and, and, and shaping. Shape the, the news, man. I mean, really. Yeah, rough week you, you know something? I, I, Joe, I got to tell you, I, I think I fell asleep at my desk today. Um, and you know how I know that? Because I woke up at my desk. Well, yeah. Okay. Uh, we would hope you fell asleep. Yeah. Um, and at any rate, uh, tonight at 11 o'clock, tune in to Caravan to Midnight with John Wells. Had a great uh, talk with John Wells today. And, of course, I'll be on the show at 11 o'clock tonight. I just I got a report that your mic sounds a little bit. Back off? I don't know. How's this? I don't know. We have uh, Anthony Patch again on yeah. tonight. He was uh, on the 22nd, I believe. And it was a fantastic show. So much information. You know what? Let me, let me do this. Uh, I'm going to put this? the CERN. How about this? Uh, Mr. Patch, can you hear us all right? Yeah, well, thanks for coming back. Despite... <laughs> despite us. Yeah, thanks for coming back. We really appreciate it. Uh, if, if, folks, if you haven't heard Anthony Patch, Anthony Patch has, has done a lot of research, a lot of investigation work with respect to CERN. And, and let me tell you something. Um, the work that he's done, I, I, I have a lot of respect for. Uh, some people, you, you know, there are investigators out there, there are researchers out there. And, uh, well, I believe strongly that, that investigators, if you're a detective, um, it's not something you can ease a skill that you can easily learn. You, you know what I mean, folks? Uh, being a detective, an art part of being a detective. The same with surveillance. If you if you're a surveillance specialist, there, there there's an artistic portion. And Joe, you know, we, we we've experienced this. There is an art to conducting surveillance, in addition to the science or the the practical nature of it. The reason I bring this up is because I, I've looked at the research and investigation of Ant and I gotta tell you man he, he's got that ability he's got that art form and uh, he certainly has applied it to CERN so and, and I have a lot of respect for him his website anthonypatch.com that's anthonypatch.com it's linked off of our website as well and that's hagmanandhagman.com so with that Joe I'm gonna toss it back to you I'll technically um, I'm pretty sure I, I had to hit a few buttons and change a few settings here because uh, just to let people know that we tried to, uh, I think we're streaming live on Blog Talk Radio again. Eric uh, set that up for us. I'm not sure how that's working. Todd says the sound is coming in great on his end. Good. So folks, if you're listening on YouTube and the sound isn't that good, I'll throw up the link to the G, right to the GCN site where you can listen, um, if you, listen right through the satellite link. And... Uh, you can keep the, the YouTube up and just have that muted if it's giving you problems. Um, and I'm not sure what was, uh, if anything was changed in the audio features over here. But uh, tomorrow we're going to be moving to our, our new studio 
and we will start uh, the video broadcast there Monday. We'll be dark on the video tomorrow. Uh, 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 maybe not. Uh, uh, maybe not. I can't wait for, ladies and gentlemen uh, who watch the YouTube, I cannot wait for you to see the new studio. Now, we've taken some before pictures and during pictures. It really, it's a mess. And it wouldn't do any justice until we get it done. Anthony, thanks for giving us a, a little bit of wiggle room here to, to kind of get some things out of the way. But um, you know, we, Eric, great guy. He built actually built two um, screens. I think they're they're six foot by ten foot each, and uh, that'll be the, the service the the video backdrop. So we've got twenty foot twenty feet of video. Um, we also have twin 42-inch monitors about the size of this thing back behind us. Uh, we've got uh, smaller monitors and, and additional cameras. Now, what we're, also the software integration. The big part of this is when people like Anthony Patch come on, we want to be able to provide you with the visuals. And when, when Anthony Patch says, hey, look, you know, this is what this part of CERN looks like, well, we want to be able to show you without fumbling around. And Eric just has done a fantastic job of, of doing that as well. But most importantly is the sound, the, the audio, and of course it's crystal clear on the Global Star Radio Network. So uh, keep tuned in to Global Star Radio Network. And I'm done with uh, all my um, uh, you know housekeeping here. Aside from the fact of letting you know that portions of tonight's broadcast brought to you by healthmasters.com. That's right, healthmasters.com. Visit healthmasters.com. Dr. Ted Brewer does a wonderful job in, uh, in really fixing, fixing you up with the right uh, nutritional supplements. Also sign up for his free newsletter. And he's a great friend of the program and a frequent guest, healthmasters.com. Joe, you, you're worrying me. You're over here looking. And you're People keep messing with asking. buttons. Okay, I know on the Global Star, the uh, audio is crystal clear. Todd and other guests of, or listeners have confirmed that. Right. But on YouTube, they're saying turn the audio up which we haven't turned it down, and um, I'm not sure why the uh, audio would be different on YouTube. So folks, just listen, uh, and Todd says, yes, it's muffled on YouTube, sound as if your regular mics are not live, and it's another, another mic and not your regular one. Huh, well, okay, that's interesting. Uh, how's sure. that sound now, since you clicked that? You know what, how about I do this? Let me just cut off the blog talk, because that could be what's causing the problem. Well, maybe we'll try that. Anthony, you're, you're a great sport for hanging Sorry with us while this. we're taking care of this. This is kind of a live thing that we're doing, and uh, we're trying to accommodate as many people as possible because we've gotten so many emails uh, that people want to hear you and people on BTR want to hear you, you know, and it's just, it's, so we, we're, we're, we've got cables everywhere. And, uh, you know, I'm telling you, man, it's, it's ridiculous how, how this, um, well, it looks like, you, you know, uh, yeah, and we do. Um, they're not paid very well. Well, actually, they're not really paid, so um, it's a labor of love for them. And uh, for us, it's just a kind of a train wreck. But anyway, well, um, Anthony, while, while Joe is starting out with this, let, let's, uh, why don't we reintroduce you to the audience? Uh, why don't you tell everyone who you are again and... Uh, uh, just give a little bit of history, and then let's we'll get right into this sermon tonight. Hmm. 
That's uh, and that's a great thumbnail. How, how many people can actually say, "Yeah, I just mess around with theoretical and quantum physics is a hobby." Okay. You know, but uh, I I, res I certainly respect that, and uh, we do have a lot to uh, talk about with respect to CERN and and the, the I believe. Um, and I think you do as well. CERN is going to be playing a, a specific role here in, in the near future. Uh, be, before I get into that, I do want to let the audience members know that uh, right now at Hagman and Hagman com, as well as Canada Free Press, I'm getting hammered for writing an article, um, really the road to World War Three or uh, you know the final countdown to World War Three three years ago. In fact, almost to the day three years ago, I wrote an article predicting, not predicting, but uh, through analysis and, and research about what's taking place in Syria and that we would be fighting Russians head to head. This from an intelligence insider. Uh, believe me, it wasn't me that thought this up. It was from someone within the intelligence community. I, I published this, and uh, sure enough, three years to the day almost, uh, you know, where we, uh, Russia is. Uh, drafting 100, 150,000, I believe, uh, soldiers that are putting ground troops and in, in, uh, military assets in, in Syria. Uh, they're going to be making air, well, they're already making airstrikes in, airstrikes in Syria and going into Iraq as well. And we are seeing the the gates to World War III open, the, the road to World War III going very strong. So, folks, if you have a chance, the, those listening tonight, uh, if you have a chance, go visit. Uh, uh, go ahead and read the article at hagmanhagman.com. Skip on over to canadafreepress.com and, uh, and make a comment because, and spread it around Facebook because I really think it's important um, to know that we're being gamed and the, the lie is huge with respect to Syria. Now, uh, that's again, and I'm going to back up here. And Anthony, the timing, it just seems very strange as well. The geopol geopolitics of the Middle East, CERN, is there a connection? Um, with respect to what's going on in, in CERN, um, perhaps, or is, is that just a stretch? Hmm. Well, all right. Uh, you know, it, it just seems like, well, the Watchmen, and, and I'll, I'm going to include you in this too, in, in, in the category of the Watchmen. It seems like our, our information is converging. And, and that's not a, uh, a, a necessarily a comfortable or a comforting thought. Um, and, and I'm not sure if we, you, I can't remember if, you, if we 
Paul spoke about this last time about the Shemitah. And I see Jonathan Kahn's out there is out there taking a pounding. Well, nothing happened in September. Well, he never said it would. Uh, you know, September is just a hinge point, a hinge moment in time. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's a historical bookmark that, uh, that, that, you know, so, so whenever, whatever you're talking about, Khan's talking about, Paul McGuire's talking about, whoever, we're talking about just these hinge moments. And, and, uh, but, but, okay, you know, thanks for pointing that out too with Paul McGuire. Very salient uh, uh, connection as well. But, uh, all right. Uh, wow. So, yeah, there is. I mean, Syria, I mean, the geopolitical situation is, in fact, an issue. And, and so, uh, connect, connected to CERN. Very interesting. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, the schedule of CERN, and folks, uh, go to Mr. Patch's website, and that's anthonypatch.com, uh, anthonypatch.com, and check out uh, all the information he has on there, and he's done several interviews uh, all across the alternative media and uh, on some of the mainstream media as well, and uh, there is a lot of uh, of information, in-depth information that um, Mr. Patch has, not only on the, the interviews he's done, but also on his books, uh, Covert Catastrophe and 2048 Diamonds in the Rough. And uh, are those both available now? Absolutely. And, um, you know, I'm one of those people that have very limited knowledge of, uh, uh, hold on a sec, that on the uh, left side, on the top there, there's, yeah, somewhere on there. And Mr. Patch, we're uh, streaming live on YouTube on video, as you know, and <laughs> we forgot, or uh, our uh, producer forgot to plug the iRig back into the, um, I got it. the iPad, and your sound wasn't coming now and we will, we'll, we'll, you know that folks listening on global star um the uh i just got plugged in so you should be able to start hearing mr patch YouTube. on youtube uh, just, just to let you know okay well, good uh, good sure <laughs> <all right. laughs> if you can when you I start know to hear 
uh, Mr. Patch, let me know. Uh, just give me a okay. Uh, yes, we can hear the guest. I just anything you can, any feedback would be would be great. Now, um, back. Uh, the first was the first one covert catastrophe, and second one twenty forty eight diamond. Yes, sir. And that you know, of course, the first book is what will soon be three books, and uh, really CERN comes into play more prominently in the second book, 2048, Diamonds in the Rough, where we talk about CERN, we also get into quantum computers and artificial intelligence and quantum entanglement. And what I propose as my model of the universe as well. So we ground while we're, you know, telling a story. You, you, you do, and I do recommend, and I've had the opportunity to uh, to scour your I recommend for people to uh, to go to your website, anthonypatch.com, and uh, support your work, support your research. It's so important right now um, that uh, John J.B. Wells and I were talking about today, about, uh, you know, people supporting the work that that we do, and I say we collectively, because you've got a, you know you've got a lot of time invested in this. You really do, and um, a lot of good results, Mr. Patrick. Now that we're reconfigured here, <laughs> go ahead and take us action as to where you think we should go. Um, we're going to kind of turn this over to you, so you can kind of just just take us wherever you want to go. Well, thank you. That's very generous of you and gracious. Um, again, format-wise, I like to give short answers and short statements, and sure. so I will stop frequently. Um, one of the things that I'd like to present is something that I don't think too many people have heard about, and that specifically is the connection of CERN to DNA research and specifically artificial DNA. And on many I have spoken of what I refer to as third strand DNA. DNA in the human form has two strands and in the artificial world three and even four strand. And there are some naturally occurring three and four strands. But in the synthetic world there definitely are three and four strands. But the real important thing to bring out is the fact that CERN, like many of the synchrotron accelerators around the world, is involved in DNA research and DNA manipulation, but more specifically, starting from scratch, or base chemicals, and actually creating synthetic life computer first as a computer model and then using live tissue. There's been quite a bit of work that's been done in, the, in this arena, but I just wanted to make the quick connection, and I'll stop here in a moment, between CERN and DNA, because it does go down a rabbit hole, and more specifically, it leads us into a portal. <laughs> Nicely played. Go ahead. All righty. Uh, going back, and I, I posted, or J.D. was kind enough to post my article on your website, and the title of the article is In Silico, is In Silicone, uh, In Silico DNA. And again, as I said, modeling DNA in a computer. And so we have moved into not only the biological age, from the information age, but we've moved into the digital biology age where we've actually taken the building blocks, the basis of the four base chemicals of DNA, and digitized those so that you can design the DNA from scratch and then utilizing, um, in some cases, 3D printers, in other cases, a uh, chip based. DNA assembler, you can actually start from the ground up 
and create organisms. And my contention is hybrid bodies that are in stasis right now, per the design that you desire, they've been playing God for quite a while now. Whoa. Okay. And, and folks, uh, Mr. Patch has is the author of an article featured right now on Hagman and Hagman. Mom, the title is In Silico DNA, In Silico DNA by Anthony Patch. Please read that article and again visit anthonypatch.com. But this article, in which you just said there, it, to me is so dramatic. Uh, the implications are, are terrifying, a little innocent. overwhelming. <laughs> And, you know, when you said uh, DNA, and I always think every time that this is, Mr. Patch, and, you, you know, feel free to, to tell me what, uh, every time I think about DNA, and I think about two strands of DNA in the World Trade Towers, and I think about the uh, the Tower of Babel and uh, Babylon in general, Nimrod and, and the hybrids, and, you know, I just see Genesis 6, the super soldier program, all of this stuff coming together now. So what you're saying, by the way, I think, is, hey, not only uh, opening portals, but um, um, reactivating DNA, as you put it, uh, and as it's put here, in stasis, uh, that's been in stasis or, or kind of latent uh, in, in hybrids. And, and if I can't, Mr. Patch, and, and I, I'm sorry if you mentioned this already, uh, wow. How much do you, uh, and I don't know if, if this is something uh, you even know, of our body is made up of dark matter, or is that something that they're trying to discover? Well, dark matter is related and is, a, is an outgrowth of what is known as the gravitational model for the universe. If you will, Einstein's model with the theory of relativity, um, gravity being the predominant force of the universe, whereas I have presented in your show last time in other venues the what I believe is the true model of the universe, which is the electric model of the universe. So with that background, who look at dark matter uh, and, and try to explain it, try to quantify it, even try to detect it, it remains only on the blackboard as a series of equations and theories. Dark matter has never been measured. Mm -hmm. It's never been reproduced in the laboratory. It's never been um, properly quantified. I mean, they've put some arbitrary numbers, some percentages to what makes up dark matter, what makes up dark energy, and what makes the rest of the known universe, which is about 4% of what we interact with. Dark matter doesn't really exist because you cannot reproduce it in the laboratory. It remains a theory. Okay, so, so I set it aside to fit the electric model. Okay. All right. So, so let's get back to the DNA aspect because uh, th that was kind of a side issue. Okay, so the sure. but the DNA. I, I want to see if I understand this correctly, okay? Because, um, and folks, you can read this, but it's the article starts out with: imagine an organism designed and replicated by software, a synthetic life? Question mark has it been successfully performed? Another question: the synthetic aspects, yes, life. Well, that's a question. Uh, this is a interpretation. What role, again, would CERN have in this? Um, it would serve as an act, it would serve like a spark plug, perhaps? I mean, um, in layman's terms. Well, um, CERN, the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, is the largest synchrotron part particle accelerator on the planet. But around we have well over 100 synchrotron particle accelerators. And those, as what I've coined the phrase, proof of concept laboratories. And they perform small specific experiments that are then, once they've been in section, that data is transferred to CERN. 
Now, I'm going to focus in on one, and that's Berkeley. They have housed in what they call the advanced light source, a synchrotron part particle accelerator. And that, again, is a ring that is spinning particles in opposite directions at near the lightest speed of light. The purpose of that machine is multifaceted, but one specific one, outgrowths or one of the productions from synchrotron energy rays, high-powered X-rays, 100,000 times more luminous than the sun itself. The brightest light on the planet is generated as of the X-rays is to look at DNA, and more specifically, the proteins that are built from the base chemicals. Those have a geometric shape to them, and they're all different. And they call that protein folding. And protein folding is what they needed to reproduce in the computer as models, and then physically through 3D printing those models of the protein, to then break it down further and get down to the base chemicals and the base structure, even at the quantum level of DNA, so they knew where they could start from scratch at the beginning. Now, the direct connection between CERN and Berkeley's synchrotron is that all of that DNA data, all of that protein folding modeling, all of the quantum physics associated with our DNA was sent on to CERN. And I'll stop there and we'll make another point about CERN, about their receiving of that data. Okay. Now, okay, think about that for a moment, uh, ladies and gentlemen, what Mr. said. All right. Um, And, and what you said that you know kind of digested a little bit. You got a machine that's looking at our DNA. And the, right, the a machine. Question, what you asked earlier, Dad, when you is CERN the modern day time of Babel? Well, even more than that, um, what what Anthony said, you've got a machine looking at our DNA. That's what right. A, mach right. a machine looking at our DNA. <laughs> Involuntarily. I mean, we didn't sign up for any of this. <laughs> right. And this is the Human Genome Project. Many, many people have heard of the mapping of our DNA. That project was um, conducted in another location other th and I'm not going to sp specify the lab because I'm trying to stay out of legal hot water. But the one lab I can mention is the laboratory in Walnut Creek, California, just over the hill from UC Berkeley. And so you have the department operating, funding and operating a synchrotron part particle accelerator and yet, Department of Energy is connected to human genome mapping. And that's where I kind of went, okay, there's something deep here. And that was years ago when I made that connection. And that's what led me to look at CERN's synchrotron particle accelerator, because if one accelerator is looking at DNA, then certainly the other one is. Uh, how can they do that? I mean, what's the mechanics behind that? Uh, how can they do that? Or what? Well, I mean, essentially, they're. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I'm, I'm, try, I'm trying to envision how how CERN can can accomplish this task. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. what, what do they use? Do they use satellites? I mean, do they use telescopes, high-powered? I mean, or do they use X-rays? I, I mean, what do they use to do this 
from a practical sense? Is there something we can look at and say, hey, that thing is mapping our DNA, aside from CERN itself? Mm-hmm. Okay, that's my The process utilized in the employment of X called X-ray crystallography. And this is where the particle is generating these X-rays, which don't occur outside of a particle accelerator, except if you're looking at something like a neutron star or theoretically a black hole or something in the cosmos, um, you know, a, a burster or um, something of that nature. Is high luminosity X-rays, but this is by inference. They're not looking at if you're not taking a picture of the proteins themselves what they're doing is they're measuring the changes in the quantum particles, the spin rate the direction of quantum particles and how they're moving by change the wave form or the wavelength of the x-rays so if you like um, visible light if you shine the light on them, you're going to cast a shadow. Well, you can measure that shadow. You can measure how opaque it is, how long it is, how wide it is, and how long it remains. And that's what you do with x-rays is you create a shadow of a quantum particle or a protein, and then you measure that shadow. And so it's by inference, not direct observation, that they gain their computer modeling of our protein and our DNA. Okay. And I I looked up here X-ray crystallography, not that I ever would have in the, uh, you know, prior to tonight. And uh, what uh, the definite, or what X-ray crystallography is, as per definition here, is a tool used for identifying the atomic and molecular structure of a crystal in which the crystalline at, um, atoms cause a beam of incident x-rays to def- uh, into many specific directions, which mm-hmm. basically what you're saying, uh, the same thing as this is saying, it's by inference in terms of, uh, it's by and intensities of these diffracted beams, uh, there can be a deduction from the consequential picture, right? Uh, of of right. The, okay, all right. Now I understand. It took took me a while. So the electron density, um, the mean positions of atoms in, we'll say, a crystal um, can be determined, as well as their chemical bonds, their order, their disorder, various other information. So that's what this is all about. And then from that, uh, a map can be generated. But how do you do that on such a large scale, or like with humans? Mm-hmm. How do you do Well, that? it's like um, computer-aided design. It's, it's a CAD program on steroids. And so you're able to take... Um, digital information and put it through a computer modeling software and develop because you're taking measurements in three different directions. You're using what are known as Euclidean coordinates, so your X, Y, and Z coordinates for a specific um, X-ray that's been diffracted into a new direction. And from those three coordinates, you can then translate them into computer rendering, a graphic rendering of a molecule or an atom or even a quantum particle. But on the macro scale, they are modeling the proteins and what they call the folding, or you'll see pictures of protein that look like um, they're spirals, and they will fold back on themselves. And those proteins all have a singular function, and they operate independently, and they have their own timing when they trigger events within our DNA. Um, They certainly don't have a mind, but chemically the proteins know when to turn on and turn off 
for their specific function. And so they want to create a model of each protein that's in our DNA so that they understand the sequencing of our DNA. And that's really where we're headed when we're talking about whether it's particularly in the Human Genome Project or CERN itself, we're headed off into sequencing the DNA. And that starts with the proteins. Very All right. Well, let me back a little bit because you had mentioned the multidirectional aspect of 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 the, I'll just say x-rays maybe that's not technically correct but um it, it, this brings me to what bring what, what immediately came to mind when you said that or the backscatter x-ray machines at airports I mean mm-hmm. do they play a part in this could this be so sinister as to include uh those machines? Well, or is that just really down a or down a dry well here? Yeah, I I don't think that there's really any play of the backscatter X-ray machines, other than their simple detectors. They're really very crude machines. And you are talking about comparing that with what you're seeing in terms of velocity x-rays okay. in a laboratory setting. So, yeah, we don't really need to go into that okay. um, all right. because it doesn't really play a role that I see. Okay. Uh, all right. So, uh, nonetheless, the article that I referenced, your article in Silico DNA, my goodness, the uh, reading that, um, and I, I gotta have to admit, I mean, I, I somewhat understand it basically. Um, but, uh, man, uh, so, so this just, uh, I suppose if, if we get nothing more out of what, what is written here, I suspect that, uh, major part and parcel to this is there's two, two after reading this, basically two things. For one, we are farther down the technological road than anyone can. Even imagine today. That's number one, and number two, the agenda, the plan that includes CERN is much more than we've ever, ever been led to believe. Even at the most fringe, use that term, roads elements of this this, this experiment. And that's why we're here tonight because we want to go into that new territory that really hasn't been. Uh, Illuminated for people, and and he is the trail for this. I mean, you're the trailblazer on this because no one else is talking about this. Not that I'm aware of, but then you know, I tend to stick to my own research. I I think I've mentioned to you before that I I try not to read other people's um, books or articles because I'd rather reach my own conclusions. And I do believe that you know. and, you know, I pray every day. I pray for guidance on where I'm to go in my research. I'm not a prophet. I'm no one special. But I do think that I have been led into areas that have not been uh, examined closely by, say, a layperson and need to be exposed. And it becomes readily apparent to me what the next topic is in research. And this is where I was led to. And in fact, I'd like to point out a synchronicity that took I don't watch television um, for a lot of reasons, but I happened to catch CNN uh, two days ago, and they had former President Bill Clinton on a show with um, a doctor that I would like you to make note of and to do some research yourself, uh, Dr. Craig Venter, V. E-N-T-E-R, was also on the program being interviewed with the former president. The subject was human longevity. And Dr. Ventner, Venter, I should say, um, founded HLI, Longevity Institute. And I'm not here to slam them in any manner, shape, or form. But... My point is, this news story, this interview, 
was podcast the very day that I completed this article on DNA, and here they are talking about immortality on mainstream media because of the sequence of DNA and their ability, and he said it right out in public, the ability to create any life form that we choose, and they do it through that computer modeling that we just described. Would they, uh, we're, we're kind of talking like, or uh, talking about like a, a 3D printer almost. Um, yes, we are. I'm still not sure I grasp the concept of a 3D printer. I'm sorry. I, mean, okay. I, I do understand it. I actually yeah. look into it a little bit, but I mean, as far as I understand, whatever you're printing, you have to have the uh, actual materials. You know, say you're printing a, um, I don't know, a, a, out of chalkboard. You know, all the materials that make up that chalkboard. Or if you're printing out, you know, they say they can print guns in 3D. Exactly. The I proper just, uh, elements in order to, to uh, do that. I mean, I can I can wrap my mind around the concept of three D printer. I just can't get my mind around the you know how it actually. But that's another thing. I, in fact, I well, I'll, I'll help you with that. Okay. Um, basically, more nu nucleotides, which are A, C, G, and T, are the building blocks, or what they call bases and base pairs, and they pair them up. At the T and G equaling 1 in the binary system, and A and C equaling 0 in the binary. And so you're able to take those four chemicals, those nucleotides, and use them if, in the same way you would use uh, the soft metals they use in 3D printers, heated metals, or more commonly, uh, the heated plastic that is injected to build a 3D rendered model. What they're doing is they're using, imagine a Petri dish, and as it's um, material instead of a gelatin, you're using sugars. And the sugar becomes the medium in which these four base chemicals of DNA, um, the sugars receive those by the injection by the printer into essentially a Petri dish for a simple way of describing it. Therefore, in that growth medium of sugar, these four chemicals will naturally come together. They will combine, and then they will begin to replicate. And therefore, depending on the configuration of those chemicals, that you use and in what sequence you use those chemicals, how you arrange those binaries determines the replication process, the pattern, and then ultimately the DNA structure itself that takes on its own life. Wow. I, I mean, really. Okay. And I'm not making this up. This was this was accomplished at the beginning of the article on May 20th of 2010. So your earlier comment about this is so much further along than we're even aware of is correct. And as we've said in many other discussions of other topics, we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg. I mean, this technology that we're being presented right now is already at least 30 years old. Yeah, I mean, the uh, the Tesla technology that was, you know, uh, uh, taken and suppressed, and you said that this, uh, I believe on the last show, you, you said that they have uh, taken this Tesla technology, and this is how they've, this is everything that Tesla understood, and they've put, turned it into real life. So, what was Tesla um, doing his work? I mean, how long ago? Uh, 80 years, 90 years ago? Um, and I'm not familiar. I, I don't know, but that's how long of a head start the they've had. Been. Um, it's been a long time that they've had yeah, this. Yeah, early. I'm sorry. No, I was just saying it's been a long time since they've had the the understanding of the technology, uh, and 
we're way behind the eight ball on this. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. I imagine a lot of Tesla's early work took place around 1905, 1910, and then progressed right on up. From there, I mean, it's phenomenal. We think about how advanced the Nazis were with their technology during World War II. Technology even itself pales in comparison to the technology that Tesla was working on experimentally. And, and so we've been we lied to. Take that yeah. forward to today. Go ahead. Yeah, finish that thought. I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. No, and we have, you know, the obvious advantage of um, computers and supercomputers and quantum computers today. So, yes, just like Moore's law, where you see. You know, every 18 months of doubling in the uh, in the processing capabilities of a computer. Well, with the quantum computer, we've <laughs> we shortened that down to 12 months, and we're not talking transistors anymore. We're talking qubits, and we'll get into that. But we're moving forward in our discussion here today to focus in and drill. What is DNA doing at CERN? Uh, yeah. That kind of, to me, is the sixty-four thousand dollar question. That's the most important question here, or the most important issue, because in in my research, uh, I found it comes back to DNA. It all comes back to the blood. It, it, you know, when, when I say the blood, it's an, we we could take that in a number of different directions. The the blood period, and the blood of our Lord and Savior, of course, in a larger sense, um, in the DNA. And this goes even a step further. I can just bring this up, and I don't want to get ahead of myself because I find myself tripping over myself when I do But, you know, think about this, folks. We're all waiting for, as Christians, we're all waiting for a great deception, or we're, the great deception is going to be part of the end times falling away and everything. And, and you know, it's like everything is a deception today. But imagine when we when we combine deception with and deception with the blood, deception with our salvation. Um. Um, you know, I'm kind of, you know, Mr. Patch, for somebody to say, um, we are a descendant of Jesus Christ on earth, living right now, a direct descendant of Jesus Christ. And you know what we can do with DNA. Uh, this is what I'm waiting for. It, mm-hmm. Obviously, it would be her- heresy and untrue. But I believe, in some way, shape, or form, that is going into the end time deception. Uh, I don't know how. I agree with you. You know, that's where we're headed. Okay. So you go ahead, and I'm going to hand the that verbal football off to you. Topic football off to you. You go we ahead. We got now. three minutes to break. Oh, three minutes to break. Okay. Um, we, but How about I'm, if we hold the big punch for the break? Well, thank you. And uh, I'm not, uh, yeah, <laughs> we, we should have you and, and then do this. You're a lot better than, than, I, than we are, that's for sure. But now, this is interesting. You know, it, it, the, when, at what point did you realize that DNA was going to be a big part or is, is a big part of what's going on in CERN? When did you realize this in the research? Well, it goes back to what I mentioned earlier. You know, I went to UC Berkeley, and I was doing some research, and I realized what was going on with the Advanced Light Source um, project, the synchrotron there. And when I saw that they were working on human DNA, and I grew up in a place called Lafayette, which is sandwiched between Berkeley and Walnut Creek, where both of these major were going on. It's like, okay, I got dropped in the middle of this. And I, I thought, okay, if I'm using a synchrotron here, and I know the LHC is a larger, more powerful one, and they're sending data from Berkeley 
through the ES net, ES5 net, to CERN on not only DNA but a number of other um, projects in physics, then there has to be a connection to DNA being employed in the physics at CERN. And when we pick, that's where I'm going to show you that absolute direct connection between And I'd like people to understand and appreciate that all these small laboratories feeders. They're feeding information to the bigger machine. And that's the relationship of the um, small labs to, the, to CERN. And we'll get into also talking about how they communicate and what that means for the mark of the beast and the one world system. Wow. Th th think about the laboratories being like DHS fusion centers feeding all the information to Central Collection Agency for information. This is yeah, this and is the, what we have with CERN. And it's other rumored that there's a CIA headquarters beneath uh, CERN at Switzerland. Don't know if that or not, but folks, tonight we're talking with our guest, Mr. Anthony Patch. His website is anthonypatch dot anthonypatch.com bookmark his site you can go there find his lady, latest radio interviews uh, and um, his, both his books Covert Catastrophe and 2048 Diamonds in the Rough that's anthonypatch.com on uh, and he is uh, an expert about CERN and and what dangers it poses what is it doing uh, Hydrogen particle Hadron, collider. Hadron collider. Hadron collider. Yeah, we're lucky and to have him. Too. It is. Uh, uh, me and my dad are idiots when it comes to this stuff. We're lucky we oh, can get the sound working, you know? General. Very well, you're listening to the Hagman, Hagman Report on this October 1st, a Thursday, here on Global Star Radio Network with Anthony Patch. We'll be right back on the other side. Stay with us.
And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to this Thursday. The Hagman and Hagman Report. It is Thursday, the first day of October already. What happened? Fourth. What happened to <laughs> summer? Anyway, it's 2015 is the year. I'm Doug Hagman. With me is Chuck Hagman in the studios of the Hagman and Hagman Report. Well, I just want to say we're very proud to be part of the Global Star Radio Satellite Satellite Radio Network, and we're very proud to be uh, in your homes tonight or in your vehicles or in your earbuds, computer, wherever you might be listening. Thanks for bringing us along. And, and you know, um, tonight we have with us Mr. Anthony Patch, and his website is anthonypatch.com. You can click on the link on our website uh, to Anthony's website as well. He was on uh, not too long ago to introduce us, and I feel like he introduced really personally. And Joe and I were talking about this earlier, Joe and I, uh, collectively, he introduced us to the depths, or the depth, I should say, or the depths of CERN, of the Large Hadron Collider. And he kind of gave, if you haven't heard that interview, please, please check it out. But he gave a lot of foundational information and investigative research uh, information with that, uh, with that interview. Now, now we're kind of taking it a step further, and we're dissecting the finer points. Now, before the break, um, we before the news break, we, uh, we're we're going to be getting into DNA in physics at CERN. We do. I just want to mention, folks, um, in preparation, we see things happening in the Middle East. We see things happening happening in Syria. We see a storm, a hurricane coming Which up. Quinn, a hurricane category four. And also there's a Oregon shooting today. An Oregon gunman singled out Christians, uh, asking those who were, if they were Christians, yes, they, he would shoot them in the head, killed 13 people today. All right. But, 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 but you see where we're at here? We're, we're really seeing an acceleration or a quick, Events. And the reason I brought that up is let's all prepare. Um, you, you know, we have to prepare. That's my view. And if we don't, we're like infidels. We'll take care of our family. If we don't take care of our children, and to me, that's that's shameful. So, folks, go to AmericanSurvivalWholesale.com. They are our go-to uh, survival company for all things survival related, whether it be long-term storable foods or survival equipment. It's Christian owned company. That's American survival wholesale.com. That's why I brought that up. And that's right. It's the war against Christians. Now we, we have not personally authenticated the veracity of, of the Christian element of the shooting. It's being reported, but we have not uh, been, uh, we have not authenticated. Because I'm sure there are going to be people out there saying, "Oh no, that didn't happen." Much like they they discounted the Columbine uh, Christian uh, element to well, that. that. This is by uh, the New York Post. So. Okay, all right. Well, again, you know, we we double source things. But having said that, guest tonight is Anthony Patch. DNA in the in physics at CERN. That's where we left off. That's where we're going to pick back up. Anthony Patch, welcome back, sir. Thank you. Um, yeah, you mentioned uh, the shooting. That's in Roseburg, Oregon, with a few hours south of me here in Portland, Oregon. And I, I would like to just ask people to pray for the surviving families and the ones that are critically wounded. Uh, this this is a horrible tragedy to imagine your own children being in school and we think of them being safe. But it's just not the case anymore today. And, I pray for those families, and just uh, unfortunate we're going to see a lot more of that. You, you know, st stuff like this, um, it it really, I mean, it can make a grown man cry, seriously. And, and, and there's make a, a grown man angry with righteous anger, but unfortunately we're going to see the but yeah, this situation being politicized. Um, 
guns being blamed, the blame not being placed where it belongs on the perpetrator and the person's actions. And of course, you know, the element of being downplayed or dismissed. So I would just urge everyone, and Mr. Patchy said, let's just pray. Pray for the families, pray for the families of those affected, and uh, pr pray for our safety, each other's safety, and, and thank you for that. But uh, all right. DNA in physics at CERN. What do you know? Where we're going with this is. And I'll, I'll cut to the chase, and we can, we need to. But it is my conclusion that you have the people at CERN who I I don't have any ill will towards any of the people that are working there because they're just humans like we are and subject to deception, misdirection, and lies as as any of us. But the point is, is that they have. Put that their goal is to um, access other dimensions. And many people have heard this, the, the opening of a portal, so to speak. But you have to ask the question, and I cite this in my article, why? Why open a portal? What's the purpose? And speaking from a Christian pr perspective, and we're looking at things through the of our Christian glasses, we turn to Scripture to look for that. And at the end of my article, I reference uh, Revelation 9, 1 through 12. And in Revelation, it talks about the opening of the abyss. And all an angel, then we have the key to the bottomless pit and the opening of the bottomless pit. And that's all well and good. I mean, it's a horrible thing, but why are they opening the pit? Why are they opening a portal? Well, the laboratory, the machine, sits right over, as we mentioned in the show, um, the bottomless pit. It's on the inside of the temple to Abaddon, to Apollo. And so you have to ask, why did they put it there? And why would they want to open the bottomless pit? And if they do open the bottomless pit, what is going to come through? Well, in a physics point and in a DNA standpoint, we can put some tools to that, and those port that portal will be open to allow demonic entities or spiritual entities to enter into our frame of existence, our realm, our dimension. But to put it in the sense of DNA specifically, I can that those spirits will actually be digital in their form. They will be digitally transmitted through the portal from their dimension, from the abyss, to our dimension. And so when people talk about spiritual entities moving from one dimension to another, I wanted to try to put that physics spin to it, to try to say, here is a tangible mechanism by which a spirit can move from one dimension to another. And I'm going to back up just a little bit, because in the sequencing of our own human DNA, we have the ability, and this has been done repeatedly, to transmit through satellite and now through the server systems, transmit that digital DNA sequence, that pattern, from point A to point B. You can be on the planet or you can be on Mars. We can now transmit DNA anywhere we choose to, including through a dimensional portal to another dimension from our side or from the other direction, from the other side, into our dimension, that spirit is a digital signal that will come through into our realm. I'll stop there. The spirit will be a digital signal that comes through into our realm. Um, well, okay, so what we have is a 
backdrop or their backdrop to this. And as you point out in your article, I'm referencing your article again. Uh, it's on anthonypatch.com, Hagman and Hagman.com. Um, connecting con- in connecting the data of practices to that of synthetic DNA in the largest, most powerful in recorded history, that being CERN, uh, it does give one reason, of course, to, uh, to pause and consider what is taking place behind closed doors. Now, you just kind of announced it, intimated or stated it. Well, perhaps you're looking at the, obviously the transference here um, of, uh, well, the transferences you referenced. But perhaps something more, of course, you, as you rightly pointed out, and I'm not sure how many people really understand that is located. It, it, it's it, it lays upon the it's set atop the ancient Roman site of the temple built worship of the sun god Apollo, and it's interesting in that context that we just saw in the uh, fall equinox here, pretty serious events taking place, and one has to wonder, um, putting all of, connecting all of these dots, you know, does this signify, is this a uh, important time in the occult, in, in occult practices, but uh, uh, what about the practices at CERN? And, and Mr. Patch, the... Uh uh, I'm doing some reading on Nikola Tesla here, and he, he talked about a direct energy weapon, um, a teleforce weapon, and a ray as being able um, mm-hmm. to, uh, it says it would send concentrated beams of particles in the air with such tremendous energy they would bring down a fleet of 10,000 enemy airplanes at a distance of 200 miles defending a nation's border would cause armies to drop dead in their tracks. Um, this is back in the 1930s that they were talking about this in early 37, the death rate. And he says that he hasn't, doesn't need to demonstrate it. It's not an experiment and demonstrated it already. Only time will pass, only a little time will pass before I can give it to the world. Um, is this, they have, they tweaked what Tesla has done in your opinion to mm-hmm. be able to project then uh, because it looks like I was just talking about sending particle particles as weapons through the air um, but what they could uh, not only send particles but particles combined to appear as though it is uh, something or someone that's correct um, what Tesla was describing was a kinetic energy weapon you have solid particles that are accelerated, and then just due to their, they can even be very small and very light in mass, but due to their speed, when they impact the target, they destroy the target without an explosive involved, just the kinetic energy. Um, Certainly the particles that are accelerated at CERN, photons or very soon, on the 16th, they'll be led. Uh, essentially, this is a, a cannon. Uh, you can use it as a directed energy, kinetic energy, and if you so choose to. I'll give you an example. Again, back at Berkeley with the smaller synchrotron, they have one of the light beams, and these are arms that radiate out from the circle, from the ring, and each one of those light beams has a gate at the end of it, a terminus, and they will conduct various types of research um, on each of those beam lines. That's a more specific term, is a beam line. You can allow these um, that are moving, let's just say at the speed of light, to exit from the machine and allow that to travel to a target. Um, I do believe this has already been done with the relativistic heavy ion collider, the RHIC in Brookhaven in New York, 
but that's another discussion. But yes, definitely Tesla was talking about a directed energy weapon particles, but you can also have the same thing in terms of using x-rays or lines of force. Uh, those all come from the same synchrotron, whether it's at Berkeley or on the bigger scale in Geneva. Okay. I, I know we come the, uh, from the former, from the, or from what we were talking about, but, you know, it, it's, it's sometimes it's difficult not to stray when we talk, when we're looking at all of the different aspects of CERN. Uh, let's get back to what we were talking about before um, as well about the gateway, about the uh, demonic entities to move into our realm of existence from their own. You said... In Satan's you called said the Prince of the Power of the Air. Remember right. that. The Prince of the Power of the Air. Prince of this world. But, but Okay. And, and I just want to lay that foundation because I think it's important um, to understand that when we're talking about this. Because, all right, and, and I agree that you mentioned the the word digital. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, expand on that if you if you don't mind. I, I, I'm having sure, a, I'm sure. having a difficult time. Um, right. No, that's okay. I'll take it from you know our own. Earth-based art dimension to begin the foundation, and then I'll move it out to the interdimensional. And on planet Earth, we have been able to take um, soil samples containing bacteria and sequence the, de the bacteria in the laboratory in the desert, for example, and then transmit that to another laboratory location where a uh, sequencer reassembles at the laboratory site. That digital information has been transmitted. Reassembled, if you want, in the 3D printer discussion, but more specifically, you're using what's called a uh, assembly device. And this device will take the digital information, combine it in software with the for base chemicals and go through that process of recreating the DNA exactly as it existed when it was gathered in the desert location. Now we can extrapolate that and say if I can transmit it through the cloud system, I can certainly bounce that off of the moon or I can bounce it off of Mars. Need to do is send ahead the receiving device, the assembly machine, and the raw chemicals to that site. So you could take a very small spaceship, if you will, with those components, send it to Mars, and when it's set up and it's ready to function, it'll receive a signal from the Earth, which will be that digital DNA, and then taking the building block chemicals sent ahead, they can begin to grow life on Mars. Now, you could do that with a human being. You could put a human on Mars. You could send light years into the universe, that digital information. And if you either found the block chemicals or you sent them that great distance, you wouldn't need the human being you could just send the digital information and the raw chemicals and grow a human being at the other end. I'll stop there. Okay. Yeah. So, that's kind of Star Trek-ish, you know. And, and, and ladies and gentlemen, pl please forgive me stumbling here because this is, to me, this is a pretty uh, grandiose concept to to really embrace mentally and intellectually and, and really I'm doing some intellectual gymnastics here in order to really understand or attempt to understand what you know all of these potentials and possibilities um, okay what you're saying is the building blocks of life can be 
if, and I think you're saying this, can be transported, teleported, I suppose, interdimensionally to another planet yes. or another location. If we were going to another planet, it would be within our own dimension, but we're this is explaining why, answering the question, why open an interdimensional portal? And it is my position, based on everything that I have read, nation comes from laboratory and university studies, Nature magazine, magazine Cornell University, etc. And it doesn't their goal is to send from our dimension, our digital DNA, into another, but quite the opposite. To have the capability here <clears throat> of machines that can receive digital information of, of entities from another dimension and assemble their DNA here in our rather than a, a physical body coming through or in the terms of Star Trek with the transporter disassembling and reassembling, we're just the raw sequenced DNA of whatever life form is on the other side so that it can be assembled on this okay. side in this realm. I get that. Uh, all right. So to things, for me anyway, pull from, we'll say, the third heaven, second heaven, or no, that's, pull from another dimension. Uh, the DNA of, we'll say, a spirit or a spiritual entity or a demonic entity, more precisely, uh, and reassemble. Well, we, we wouldn't that spirit or spiritual entity, the demonic entity, in whole or as a whole, but we can extract the or uh, bring bring forth the building blocks, the DNA itself. Or a replication of uh, uh, a digital replica replication and rebuild it using uh, living matter. An here. assembler, let's say. Okay. Right. All right. And, and, and folks, please. And so uh, we. You know, yeah. yeah, I just want to say that this is a very, to, to me, this is a very complex and difficult uh, issue to, to talk kind of, you know, ladies and gentlemen, I'm working through this with each and every one of you as we're talking. Uh, I, and, and Mr. Patch, I just have to ask this, and this is kind of an off-the-cuff, off the mm -hmm. unscripted question. Who in the world do you talk to about this? I, I mean, uh, you can't sit down at a coffee shop and grab a, grab a you know, waitress and say, hey, I want to talk to you. I want to bounce an idea. Off. I mean, who, who do you talk to about this? A very small circle of people that I can trust and that also understand uh, the science. And again, I'm a translator, so I have to speak to people that are greater knowledge and expertise in these areas than my own. And I find myself stumbling and bumbling and fumbling along trying to grasp what they're sharing with me. But it is a very small circle of people because, as you know, I... I was asked to stop doing this back in June, and so I keep that circle very close. But I do get the opportunity to share the information with you mm -hmm. and with Joe and with your audience. So in a sense, I'm having a conversation, albeit a one-way conversation with your audience, but I am with your audience. So that is my outlet. That is my ability to have some communication with people. But... It, uh, it's pretty limited because even the people don't want to go to the occult discussion, and that's where we're at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in biblical, as you point out, Revelation 9, uh, Revelation period. I mean, um, you know, and of course what we're talking about here as well, it gives a different side or a different aspect to why. Example: You've got the statue of of Shiva, the Hindu deity Shiva, the destroyer. Mm -hmm. 
dance, the dance that they've yeah. done around Shiva. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> dancing mm-hmm. with the devil. Um, yeah, and, and there's a, apparently yeah, a, there's a skull, symmetry video. A, a skull and crossbones uh, also there, uh, from what I understand. And in, in, in the context of our conversation, you have written that spirits mm-hmm. perhaps may further be defined in this as digitized biology and folks you know i look i i'm seeing seeing and saying man this this is really kind of way over my head but it's over our heads too and this is why we're having a conversation that makes sense of it okay so spirits uh, perhaps may further be defined and described as digitized biology organisms replicated by software imitating life in silico which goes back to the conversation via an artificially intelligent 600-cell nano-diamond tetrahedron fourth dimension quantum computer connected to other worlds. So in other words, uh, that was a mouthful. In other words, you've got this, the, the, the ability, I suppose, right now to, uh, well, let me rephrase that in the form of a question. Do we have the ability? right now to do exactly that. In other words, to reach out interdimensionally and bring back these demonic entities in the form of a digitized biology. Yes. Um, again, we're only privy, I'm only privy to limited amount of information as to what their capabilities are. I can only extrapolate search papers that have been published what the capabilities are, but I think it doesn't take much to see the endpoint, and the endpoint is here based upon quantum computing. And the adiabatic quantum computer is the one that I'm referring to in the article. That computer has the ability right now, has since 2010, to take what's called a combinatorial, a combination of all possible solutions and simultaneously present those in the form of a question into another dimension. Because it operates, when you talk about quantum computer, you're operating in the quantum level, in the quantum state. We're talking about quantum entanglement, supersymmetry, superposition, things like that. And the point is, is that the computer already operates interdimensionally, albeit in a very short duration fashion and in a very small area we're talking about nano sized opening that exists for a picosecond into another dimension just long enough to transmit a signal but then they receive from the other side this is what Tesla was doing receive from the other side the other dimension an answer to that combinatorial equation. This computer is what enable them to control CERN, control the power, achieve the opening of a interdimensional portal, and that machine will also be responsible for receiving the digital information that it will process and allow for that reassembling of that artificial, artificially created DNA. So you have the computer already since 2010 to pull this off. Uh, Since 2010, so that we know of. It it, it could have been earlier, right? I mean, we can verify it. It, Sure. Okay, so it could have been earlier. So this could have been happening. What's the end game here? Um, the immediate end game. I, I I know the end end game, but uh, if what's what's the next step here? If taking place, what's the next step, or what's taking place now, perhaps? Well, let's take a step back just a little bit into 2010, because look at the beginning of my article. That is when the first synthetic organism was created in the laboratory that, quote, was alive, was 2010. Same date, as far as my research goes back, 
that they publicly announced the existence of this quantum computer, which at that time was the Model 128. And therefore, you can say that since 2010, at least in terms of public information, they've had this ability to use a quantum computer in combination with reassembling of DNA. The end point is they want to bring through what may be the locusts that we talked about and is at the end of this article from the bottomless pit. But I also believe that the artificial human figure that will be performing the miracles and wonders will be a construct of sequenced artificial DNA that is generated by this computer. In other words, they're going to create a humanoid figure from artificial DNA using an adiabatic quantum computer that not only is responsible for the pole, but is responsible for the beast. So they're going to create That's what it looks like to me. They're going to create a humanoid amongst the ones that have already been created, but one figure. Okay. Let's let's. And that's on. where we go over the edge. Okay. Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, man, I went over the edge about an hour ago, uh, talking about this. But okay, so so let's let's kind of focus in and hone in on this. If they're able to do this, why stop at one? Why stop at a hundred? Why stop at a thousand? Or just one, and that's all we need in terms of the beast. It's the yeah, I think I think that you've got a, a multitude of things that are happening here. You have the army that is coming through, again, that is spoken of in Russian, but you also have the leader. So you have not just one, but multitudes that come through. And this is in Scripture called opening the key, opening the bottomless pit. The, key, the Large Hadron Collider, the opening of the pit is the opening of the portal. And the uh, surfacing of these demonic entities are essentially what you see coming through and being replicated and being reproduced from their digital spiritual signal into living organisms. And that's why I believe that this machine is responsible for fulfilling described in Revelation. Man, none, none of this is good news. I mean, this is... <laughs> Now we can see, if if we can't, I mean, I can barely articulate what you're saying. So imagine uh, John on the Isle of Patmos writing the book of Revelation, attempting to describe what he is seeing in his terms. Man, okay, I see, yeah. what, you know. That's tough. That's right. And, and Having the same problem in in this conversation, yet you're doing a great job in in, in taking us uh, step by step here. Uh, all right. So what we're about I suppose is the assembly, the creation, the assembly of a satanic, demonic, non-human honey of demonic spirits, which makes me think of the uh, you know Nephilim. Uh, or those, mm -hmm. you know, of the fallen ones, the Nimrods, the Hercules kind of, of myth, you know, mythological type of uh, fame. So this is what what you're seeing, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is what you're you're postulating. Yeah, and I'm trying to apply our technology to what appears to be purely a spiritual process and saying that there, there needs to be a physical component to this spiritual process. If spirits are allowed out of the bottomless pit, are they essentially in a physical form already, or do they need to be 
created from their essence, from their spirit, into an actual physical form. And I believe that's the reason we have all that capability today, because the spirits need that technology in order to realize a physical form. And that's what Tesla was involved in. Okay. That's what he was doing because he was put on the path that has resulted in the Large Hadron Collider. The technology was necessary. Today. And, and this makes perfect sense to me when you start, the way you just explained that, the, the, the spirits, well, what are they going to occupy? Uh, um, they need uh, a physicality not just spirits, you know, they need, they need form. So what you're saying is, well, form can be created for them here. Or are you, could, you, could we say, perhaps, that form would be given to them by way of uh, humans already here in this, in this dimension? Okay. Or could it be a combination of, of, of both? Sure. I think we can agree that there are, roaming the planet already, uh, the spirits of the fallen angels, the spirits of the Nephilim, that have taken on here. But in order to have the large quantity of soldiers, so to speak, army to fight against God at the time of Armageddon, here in this realm, we need the technology to build that army. Certainly, it's, I have no reason to doubt that we do have those Nephilim spirits and those fallen angel spirits roaming the planet, as it says. And therefore, they are the ones that are responsible for feeding high-tech information, this hidden knowledge that we were not supposed to have access to. They've been providing it. And therefore, we see these machines, and back in the middle 1800s, we were still horse and buggy. And here we are with an interdimensional machine. Uh, that doesn't happen through normal of education and advances in technology. This is given to us, in, pardon the pun, quantum leaps. You're exactly correct about this, and I related this uh on an earlier show this week, you know, did, how, how did we exist, you know, until the early 20th century? The, the oil lamps and, uh, uh, you know, horse and buggy. And then for a, really, for the next century, this, this as you put it, a quantum leap, leap in technology. And, and you know, uh, my, my wife and I, or my wife said, you know, more smart people. And, 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 you know, yes, I understand that. But where did this knowledge come from? Was this a convergence of uh, great minds and, and, and uh, innovation? Or, or was this, you know, explain to me, because, or pretend my wife was sitting right in the room, really answer her question. Explain to my wife, who's who pretends sitting right here, to go from the horse and buggies in the 1900s, or early 1900s, that is, 1800s, um, to, to the car, to the technology of today, in that short period of time. What happened? Where did it come from? Well, certainly we've had some brilliant peppered through, you know, recent history, like Einstein and Tesla and others, you know, individuals, but they're not solely responsible for the advances that we have seen. Those that have read the stories and the biographies of Tesla and Einstein, but more importantly, Tesla in this frame of reference, Tesla openly that he was communicating with entities from another realm, and he was gaining his information directly from, from them. There have been people like Edgar Casey and others that have also communicated with the other side spiritually, 
and they have been able to or lucid dreaming or even awake states they've been able to information and have the intellect to be able to put that information in and so everything that I have read indicates that that's one of the processes the other process is and I think Paul McGuire even referenced this yesterday in his discussion with you, is that there's a lot of information held by the secret societies, and everybody kind of rolls their eyes when we start talking about that. The secret societies carry forward the occult knowledge and the occult practices and rituals forward into our time frame. So there is ancient knowledge from the time of the Babylonians that has been carried forward combined with people like Tesla and their information with cult rituals. And the rituals are nothing more than a form of communication with the other side. And Tesla was involved in that. So you have the combination of directed information coupled with hidden knowledge and practices straight forward from, let's say, even the Tower of Babel. And many people have made the or the connection of the Tower of Babel to the Large Hadron Collider, and I agree with that. So that, in a nutshell, I think explains a lot of the advances that have taken place. Okay. All right. Should we? Is this a, a good time to ask or talk or discuss singularity? Uh, you know, uh, transhumanism. Uh, because isn't this the other side of that, the same coin where you've got people and we read the headlines every every so often uh, it seems so now then more than ever where there's this uh, this really transhumanistic uh, taking place and this uh, this uh, advancement toward like God living forever, you know that kind of that kind of thing. How does that fit mm -hmm. into to what we're seeing? Well, we go back to talking about long and the agenda of the transhumanist uh, groups immortality, and that takes us back to the Garden of Eden and the lie that was presented that we could be as gods if we gain this information the tree of life. And therefore, we're seeing today exactly what took place in the time of the Eden. And essentially, what we're looking at is people who have bought into the original way that you can be as gods. And whether you're talking about transhumanism, or you're talking about human longevity discussions, or immortality is really the the real way to say human longevity, their real agenda is immortality. But we're going to go a little further beyond that. But just to qualify what transhumanism is, that as an intermediate step. Most of the discussion of transhumanism is the merging of man and machine, um, if you will, uploading ourselves into it. That's an intermediate step. And we're beyond that. Where we're at now is actually being able to create a body, as we said, from sequence to DNA sized biology. A body can be grown, and then you can be transferred into your essence, your spirit, your soul. That's a, that's something that would have to be defined and and proven. But at least perhaps your memories. Again, digitized memories transferred from you to a body that's artificially created. And if you continue to do that, possibly you could live forever. That's the lie that they've bought. Okay. Kind of like cyber sapiens instead of homo sapiens. That term. Uh, through through sure. life extension or life extension 
is, and you're exactly right, uh, live, uh, f- you know, free of disease. And this is a good thing. Uh, you could live for, technically forever. And, and really, um, and if I could take a side, kind of a left turn here. Um, in the in the scheme of things, do the charnel these abortuaries that we see, the uh, uh, and the, the the sale of tissue and or the sale of actually mm-hmm. of, of you know cadavers, dead babies, does this play into anything at all? I mean, is this a factor, or am I reaching? No, and part of it has to do with um, this is. Unfortunately, again, we're going back to the occult. We're going into witchcraft, and we're going into sacrifices. That's what a lot of this represents. But also, this is the gathering of tissue for the purpose of research so that they can perfect the digital biology and come up with the perfect humanoid form. Part of what you have to do with DNA is you have to look at the structure of DNA and look at the chromosomes and look at the pattern of the arrangement. And we've heard things like we have DNA. Well, that's purely nonsense. You have to be able to say, okay, here is the sequence that is, quote, a particular disease or deformity. So we're going to eliminate that. And through that process, you continue to do that, comparing multiple samples of tissue from multiple thousands of human beings so that you have a broad statistical basis for the sequence of DNA in which you can say, okay, we can eliminate things. We've proven these portions of certain types of defective, if you will, defective DNA that's causing these diseases or short lifespans, we can eliminate those and we're left with the purest. Sounds like eugenics and Nazis. Pure DNA, and that's what they're targeting through the gathering of that tissue from those abortion centers. They are trying to find the purest of the DNA sequence, the purest digital code they can come up with and then build the perfect humanoid body from that. You know, you talk about perfection and, and uh, God, uh, um, you know, God's creation. And it's interesting that, that this topic and, and a lot of, a lot of uh, and a lot of people pass over this, but um, this was discussed. We, I mean, Jesus, even we read about the creation of of plants, for example, and, and everything. And, and uh, you know, uh, the Lord was very particular in how, for example, how each plant produced seeds and according to their kinds, and each was unique, and each was good, and uh, continued to be that way without genetic modification, and then all of a sudden we have now genetic modification, and, and you know, we, we mm-hmm. are, we, you know, we, we see it's this attempt for uh, a super race, or back to Hitler and such, and, and, and the, more, the more we talk about this, the, the, the less able I am the occult, uh, the nefarious, from mm-hmm. current things. So, wow, okay. Man. Great to too, because it's, that's the germ, that's the germination of all of this multi-layered agendas, as I call it, is the occult desire, and the end game is to kill. That's really the whole thing. We, we hear about, you know, Satan or Lucifer trying to create his own version of heaven on earth and that type of thing, Mageddon, is leading to this end point that was 
for Satan and his armies that he's creating digitally and otherwise to fight against God and his angels and to try to kill God because he feels in his own hubris that he can accomplish that. And that's how deceived in his own mind he has made himself. Yeah, you said that last time, and that um, is something that, you know, it, I've understood, but when <laughs> when you just come out and say it, you know, they're planning on, on invading heaven and killing God, uh, and to think that they can kill what has created them, um, them being created beings as well. Uh, the height of hubris. Yeah, it, it's, it's <laughs> mind-blowing. I mean, I guess that makes it, it backs up the point of the pride of Satan and why he fell due to that pride. I guess the pride is is that blinding. Uh, we have a listener question from a Lori. Sure. She says the subject is stuff. Please ask Mr. Patch about the bones they found a few years back that were half man, half beast. Take a piece with the DNA, put it into computer, and poof, instant. Uh, Chimera? Chimera. Chimera. Yeah. Chimera. Mm hmm Yeah, yeah, Chimera. We go back to, you know, pre-flood. We talk about the Nephilim and, you know, L.A. Marzulli and Tom Horn and all these guys have done a great job of educating people about the Nephilim and the giant. The Chimera is a mix, mixture of animal and human DNA. And those things that were prevalent, and that's why you know, God saw fit to um, destroy what was essentially abominations to his creation. We're right back there now. This is exactly where we're at. There are chimeras. Um, in Britain, a couple of years ago, there were was a news article of 110 different types of chimera that were created and supposedly they were they were killed once they um, were done experimenting with them. But you've got to wonder how many of those they kept and how much more has been produced. So chimera is no big deal in the world of DNA splicing, cloning, and taking the actual digital sequencing and building from scratch your own custom. Man, okay. And I just want to remind listeners, if, if you have a question for our guest, Anthony Patch, is this website, anthonypatch.com. But if you've got a question about CERN that's been on your mind and it's relevant to and to what we're discussing, please uh, go to Hagman and Hagman.com. Click us form and uh, uh, just simply put in the subject line question for guest and type your question out, and please try to be as succinct as possible. And from there, we'll ask Mr. Patch your questions. Because, uh, yeah, th this is a broad topic here that we're, that we're talking about. Um, all right. Um, and I, I would like Can to Can I point step back just for a moment? Oh, please do. Yes. Just, just one last comment. Again, you'll see in the article on your website, there are college students around the world that are involved in competitions utilizing these assemblers, these sequence reassemblers, in which they are gleeful, say, creating life forms that don't naturally occur and have never been seen. If you want to call them chimera or hybrids or whatever, but these are small organisms that are alive that they're just like they did back in 2010, and it's from digital biology. In the is that we laid out today, so to say, well, they're making you know animal-human hybrids or even pure human hybrids is nonsensical. Well, look around the college campuses and look at the competitions that they're doing, and supposedly they're destroying those or after at the conclusion of the competitions, but you got to wonder, you know, what do they do with some of the ones that they really like? <laughs> wow. 
And, and a lot of these universities are connected and, and funded by or connected with or associated with uh, the intelligence agencies, the CIA, uh, as a matter of fact, are recruiting grounds there. They themselves are petri dishes for experimentation that you're referencing. So, you know, exactly mm -hmm. how deep is that? All right. Um, okay. My goodness. All right. We uh, have uh, about three minutes for the break. <clears throat> I'm going to grab here another listener question here. Oh, you uh, I just I thought it was very interesting from Anthony because I know we only have three minutes here. Um, existing DNA-based storage consisting of one gram of DNA can bytes of data uh, representing 14,050 mm -hmm. gigabyte Blu-ray disk. I just thought people just so people understand the, the what about here um, the uh, the synthesizing and sequencing of DNA and uh, you know initially how it took years for the original human genome project to a single human genome uh, which consists of over three billion DNA pairs uh, today lab equipment with with the, these microfluid chips perform in minutes and you point out in your article existing dna based data storage again consisting of one gram of dna can store 700 terabytes of data and uh just uh, that's really mind-boggling when you think about it it really is but I shows you the capability of creating an artificial Mm. Um, biological brain. My word. Okay. And, and, and folks, if you're having a difficult time understanding this, I, I, I feel for you because I am too, and I know, Joe, we're struggling with this. But it's a struggle to understand the complexity of the agenda, uh, or at least the self, as we approach these perilous times, um, you know, as we, as we head technological explosion and uh, really the technology of the fallen i believe is at play here and, um while we're a minute out from the break i just want to reiterate some of the things that we talked about this week uh, with paul mcguire and a few other guests that are important uh you know we are beings and living in a physical uh, uh body here on earth and we're told we're not of the world um and we are uh, of the Lord, and if we're of the Lord, we're not of the world, and that the things of this world are subject to change. Uh, we can have our, our visuals, our audio, our hearing, all this can be manipulated. All the things in this world can be manipulated. It is a, a physical world. And we're told to, you know, trust in God with and uh, to follow him. And it's going to become important now more than ever, especially with the things Mr. Patch is talking about, uh, you know, and what Revelation talks about, what the prophets have talked about, the, you know, coming tribulation, the loosening of the uh, opening of the bottom of demons loosening on earth. We're going to need to be, uh, have God our sole focus and priority. We need to make that a daily behavior, you know, to wake up, to pray, to read the scripture before we do anything else, to make sure we're protected. Folks, you're listening to Anthony Patch on this October 1st edition, Thursday, of the Hagman and Hagman Report on our radio network. We'll be right back after these short messages for our third and final hour. Stay with us.
And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to our third and this first show, first day of October 2015. Today's a Thursday. Our guest is Anthony Patch's website is anthonypatch.com. That's anthonypatch.com. Check out his website. You can look at his uh, past and upcoming radio interviews. Um, he has a certain schedule on there. Lots of content and a link to his YouTube page where he has created uh rich videos describing in great detail uh, better than anyone else about and um, what the ramifications of their uh, of the elites plan uh, with CERN and, and what they plan to do uh, to the world through these uh, but first you have yeah you know yeah I just want to share with our with our family listeners you know we about problems and about how bad things are economically, uh, you can take control of your finances um, with a self-directed IRA, 401k. Contact Ross Powell at survival401k.com, survival401k.com. Imagine being able to um, invest in such things as uh, precious metals, or even long-term storable food from American Survival Wholesale, or guns and ammunition, anything that, that you can think of, uh, contact Ross Powell at survival401k.com. Simply go to hagmanhagman.com, click on the link, uh, or call 844-MY-GOLD-2. That's 844-MY-GOLD in the number 2, 844 844- my gold in the number two to talk directly with Mr. Ross Powell. Tell him that you heard it on the Hagman and Hagman Report. Our guest tonight is Anthony Patch, anthonypatch.com. And we were having a really a delightful conversation during the break uh, just about, uh, about a number of things, about spiritual issues. The spirit of fear, the spirit of not fearing. And, and uh, you, you know what, Mr. Patch, uh, I'm just gonna, we're just going to open it up here, turn it over to you. Let's talk about how people can become wrapped up erroneously so in this. Well, thank you. I really like to take an opportunity when I'm on shows like this to take away that fear if possible by letting people know that really where my personal security, my personal feeling of well-being comes from is directly from Christ and my personal relationship with him. You know, I'm no different than anyone else. I'm not special. Uh, I'm thankful I have Christ in my life, and therefore he takes away because he is under control of everything. It's his plan. I'm only doing his work, and when we have that feeling of fear because of the thing that I'm talking about and other people like me are presenting all these doom and gloom scenarios. Turn to Christ for the safe, you know, for saving your soul. Take away that fear. I mean, that's a very tangible thing. It'll help you sleep at night. And I've had that question put to me. How do you sleep at night? No one sleeps very well. Because there really is no reason to fear when you know that with you and that the Holy Spirit is within you, and you know the end game, you know the plan that He has just by reading Scripture. And there's a lot of comfort that comes from reading Scripture every day. He will talk to you through Scripture, and that's what I really would like people in these these discussions that we have is there's no reason to be fearful. God's in control. I love that. And I also like to take it a little bit lighter and say, humor, too. So <laughs> there's some humor involved in the hubris that we observe in these characters. Now you're absolutely right. We are told uh, throughout Scripture that uh, the only thing we should fear is to fear the Lord, and fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And beyond that, uh, you know, they, the Lord says, fear not those who can... Uh, kill you, but fear those who can kill you and take your soul. And uh, you know, our soul is, is in the Lord's hands, and that is dependent upon what we do here on earth. And we are, 
God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of sound mind. That is uh, first or second uh, Timothy one seven, uh, I believe. And we have to, no matter what we're looking at, what no matter what the enemy, uh, I mean, if they project a, a digital or real uh, fallen angel that's two hundred feet tall with you know razor sharp teeth that go throughout their whole head and scissor hands, I mean, we have to stand there in the power of the Lord and rebuke it with without any fear and it's a lot easier said than done and this is why you know we go through these uh, little issues in our individual lives we have problems we have tribulations we have persecutions we have all these different things that we go through that we see as huge problems at the time but this is the lord molding us like clay to be more uh, accordance into his will um and so this it's so important that we understand that none of this stuff should move our fear in any way. The fear of the Lord is the only fear we should have and know that he will and take care of his, his people and uh, the enemies will all be destroyed and put under his feet. I agree with that. Amen. There's an interesting just little thing that I do throughout the day and I'm sure there are other people who do this as well and if you feel like you're being set upon by the influence of Satan, if you feel like there is even a influence or you're being persecuted, my technique is to say in the name of Jesus Christ, Satan, get behind me. And you're minions. You have no power here. And at the name of Jesus, they have to flee. And that happens constantly. And that's just a tangible little thing that I like to do and share with you. You know, that to me um, is so reassuring because we do have that power. We have the divine power. We have the authority, or the, I shouldn't say we have the divine power. Uh, the divine power or the power of God goes through us by the Holy Spirit. And, and, and so, so we, we do have power at our disposal, and, and that is the power to uh, rebuke the fear. And a lot of people... Uh, we, we get accused all of the time of promoting fear, and we're f doom porn fear artists. And, uh, well, you know, that's because uh, to the current events of the world can be frightening to those who don't have the Lord. Uh, and, you know, we can't take that personally. Uh, no, I, I get that. But what but, but Mr. Patch said, you know, I mean... Um, I, I think I think we have to approach this in near of uh, information as well as fear repellent because yeah uh, the, the only thing we should or the only person the only odd beyond that I, I don't think we should be fearful Joe as you said it's, I agree. it's easier said than done but yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. all right um Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I think you had a question from one of your listeners. Yeah, jo Joe's got a couple. Yeah, I we believe got a bunch of questions. Yeah, so um, I'm going to I'm going to go ahead, Joe. I'm going to give it to you. I've got questions over here too. I'm not sure if we have the same ones. <laughs> so go first ahead. one's from uh, Jan. She says, uh, uh, "Mr. Patch, how do the Rockefellers, or how are the Rockefellers, discern?" Well, they're a funding source. They're a funding um, director, if you will. And we mentioned earlier about the secret societies, and you often hear the phrase, you know, follow the money. Well, that's what's going on. CERN has uh, really an unlimited budget, and they're responsible for the economic decline around the, the planet because they've been drawing funds from virtually every country in the, in the planet. Uh, the Rockefellers are nothing more than administrators. They're just a, um, a glorified group of bankers. And it's the bankers that are in control of not just the economic system, but our social structure, political structures, and now even our religious structures and the organized religion. So uh, the Rockefellers are just money managers. That's really all they are. Okay. Who's when you say they're just the money managers? Obviously, the Luciferian elite are behind. 
the uh, the nefarious agenda we're seeing, but um, who's behind the rock? I mean, who's behind the money managers? Aside from the satanic elite, do we know uh, specifically, or, or, or are they still covered in these nebulous secret societies like the, you know, the Committee of Three Hundred and so on, or are they below the Rockefellers and Roth? Bloodlines of the Illuminati. I mean, ultimately, where does the dollar or where does the up in this align? Well, it's the occult leaders, the occult practitioners, and I'm not privy to their names. It's not an area that I delve into. I choose not to become that exposed to the occult side other than understanding some of their. Um, so I can't really answer the question as to who's involved or site names organizations other than things like Trilateral Commission, et cetera, et cetera. Um, those are the obvious public uh, faces that are out there that you can see. Everybody talks about Bilderbergers and, and all of that. But when you go to things like the Bohemian Grove, California, North, Northern California, just outside of Santa Rosa, and you know of the world leader at Bohemian Grove for ritual sacrifices and things like that. That's where you're really drilling down. You're getting into the people that are actually involved in satanic rituals. Now, Joe, you mentioned earlier briefly the the choreographed dance that they did at CERN, the video. It's called Symmetry that they're presenting for public consumption. But that's an indication of what they're doing behind the scenes. They're always involved in rituals that further their ability to gain information and guidance in the assembly and operation technology. The ability to conduct what they're doing at CERN, be successful with it, is driven by information and guidance that they read from the other side. And that's about as far as I can pinpoint it. I can't give you any other names or positions beyond that. Okay. All right. Well, I mean, uh, if anyone wants to drill down to, to really the power behind the power behind the uh, faces, uh, we can we can do that, but okay. Here's a, a question from uh, Karen R. And uh, let me, is the DNA CERN is creating in microscopic form put in larger or electromagnetic same form to make Jacob's ladder to Is it the same DNA idea or something different to make Jacob's ladder? Yes, that's a good question. I, I understand that she's been uh, on my other talks, and we mentioned this last week as well, Saturn. The DNA that will be coming through the interdimensional portal has this pathway. We not only have the abyss below CERN, because it's positioned right over it, but we also have entities that are trapped within the planet of Saturn. And this is, again, where it goes over the edge and people begin to think, boy, this guy's really lost it. But this is, again, coming from the occult world and from who they worship. And you've seen plenty of uh, associated with Saturn, etc., all through history. From the physics standpoint and the DNA standpoint, the DNA will be released, again, the digitized spiritual entity will be released from Saturn and will travel along what I have called Birkeland currents. These are electrical pathways that be originated in the form, if you will, Jack Jacob's ladder, originating from CERN, broadcast to the southern pole of Saturn, and the Birkeland currents are arranged, naturally occurring arranged, helical fashion, identical to the helical pattern of our own DNA. That will be the pathway in which the digitized spirit will be released from Saturn or spirits, travel along the Birkeland currents, moving through what is called a 
which is a magnetic field that looks like a donut. And that is where the portal itself will be originated and established is in a donut-shaped toroidal field. The digital information traveling along the Birkeland currents will go through this toroidal field and then align with and enter the abyss. They will all join up and be released. Wow. <clears throat> all right. Okay. That's the mouth. Well, yeah, I mean, consider that. It, it's, it, I mean, just consider that. Just consider what was just said there. Yeah, let's uh, grab another question here. This is from Jane T. Mr. Patch, do you think they will accomplish what they are hoping for using lead in the next few weeks? And what do you think they will try using in the after the lead? In the beaming after the lead? Yeah, it says, do you think they will accomplish what they are hoping sure. for using lead in the next few mm -hmm. weeks? And what do you think they will try using in the beaming after lead? Okay. Well, the beaming after the lead, I think what they're referring to is what we just described. And the lead is used to generate 14 electron volts, which they've determined from observations in the cosmos is uh, to open this portal. And we discussed last week the separation of the interacting massive particles with Stan Deo opened up with last week were the WIMP. And that's breaking the nuclear bonds between these um, heavy particles. That's what the lead will do. It will break the bonds between the WIMPs, and that will allow the tearing of the fabric, the opening of the dimensional portal from a physics standpoint. The lead will collide on the 16th of November, and between there and December 13th, they will continue to collide particles of lead. Now, they can be successful in opening that portal, and I do believe they will be, between the 16th of November and December 13th mean that on December 13th, that's when the portal opens. It means any time during the time frame, I believe they will be successful in achieving 14 tera electron volts, and the opening of the portal will occur, and then all the dynamics of what we just described earlier will take place. Now, I can be completely wrong. I'm only basing that upon the schedule, public schedule, that comes out of CERN itself. Being published by them is subject to question. So it may not happen in that time frame. It may happen next year. I can only base it upon the calendar that they have published as to the timing of their agenda for opening the portal. Okay, I've got a question here. This from a uh, Bobby. Bobby for your question and this this is really relevant to what you're just saying uh, the connection between CERN and Saturn in terms of proximity in other words um, mm -hmm. in your research okay thank you uh, was looking back at the, at the research on, or looking back at CERN in your research that has been done can you point to uh, the reactivation of CERN or the activation of CERN when Saturn was closest to the Earth? And if so, does proximity matter? Or question mark, I should say. Mm. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, proximity does not, and alignment does not. If necessary, they can actually utilize the moon itself, uh, relay station. So trying to determine when that happened based upon the, the distance between us and Saturn is irrelevant. The 
alignment of Earth to Saturn is irrelevant. So we can't really pinpoint a time based upon alignments and proximity. I will add to this that if you go to the Thunderbolts project, uh, Thunderbolts project is the one, is the group of gentlemen that are Thornhill and, and Dave uh, Talbot, who are really educating people in a about the electric universe, that model of the universe. And in that, they talk about the original alignment back in, quote, the Golden Age, and this is what they're trying to re-establish, is this alignment that occurred between the Sun, uh, Venus, <clears throat> excuse me, Venus, Saturn, Mars, and the Earth. Is the theory that they put forward, and I'm in agreement with, was there was a direct alignment such that it almost obscured the sun. There was only a corona, a crescent visible of the sun at any given time, day or night, that was blocked. The proximity of Saturn to Earth was such that there was an electrical connection established between Saturn and the Earth, along with the other planets, in which electrical discharges, electrical plasma and Birkeman current connections existed between the planets and the Earth. And therefore, you see in the ancient um, beliefs of gods and assigning human form to behavior, and then the separating of the planets because of the wars between the gods that took, took place in mythology, that all comes out of the separation and the collision of planets like Jupiter and Saturn, causing plasma discharges, to, which people thought of as lightning or thunderbolts. And therefore, back in those days, that electrical connection in the close proximity of the planets, which is what they're trying to reestablish using CERN, generating the Birkeland currents to the southern pole of Saturn. You know what? I followed that. <laughs> and that's... Okay, good. Okay. Very good. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, let's see. We have a lot of great questions, and I'm just trying to put them in. I mean, you, you've got them over there, too. Go ahead. Yeah, I am uh, trying to find... Um, let's see. Okay. Please ask Anthony if you feel it to be applicable. All Jewish holy days ending on 10 4 15. Do you anticipate CERN uh, to have any significant events or to take place uh, shortly thereafter, the, the 10 4 through 10 6 uh, dates? Short answer is no. Okay. I'm basing that upon the published schedule from CERN themselves. They could surprise us. They could do something completely unexpected, and um, that's why I think it's worth paying attention to what they're doing. But if I'm going to base my on their published calendar, no, I don't see anything that will be of service with them. They're still in what they call machine development, which is really nothing more than calibration and testing, and they're sending um, synchrotron energies and directed energies and minor collisions into what they call the north area, which is a target that absorbs these particles in various low-level experiments, low experiments that are going on. So, no, I don't expect anything of significance to happen. But we okay. did discuss last week the effect of the magnets and gravimetric waves and the increase in earthquakes. So there's always the possibility they'll be doing something that they're not going to advertise and we could see some significant earthquakes. Just like we had with um, Chile a couple of weeks ago, the 8.3, which I think has a correlation within about four hours of the powering up of CERN. Yeah, we talked about that. Um Here's an interesting question from uh, Roger S. Engineering and preparing the planet for the return of the Nephilim. And how 
it in. Sure. Um, yes, I've brought this up many times. Uh, your, your listeners with the questions have done their homework, and they've been listening to me, I can tell, so that's great. Um, yes, terraforming is a major component of what these guys are doing, and they're doing that to get themselves get an environment that is conducive to whatever entities that they want to bring through digital um, take on a life form here. So, as I said earlier, part of the agenda with Satan is to create his own version of heaven on Earth. So they are using the machine to terraform the planet. In the near, it's, you know, greater earthquakes and whatnot, but they're also modifying and affecting the magnetosphere or shields around the planet. And that is allowing quantities of X-rays and gamma rays to come through, along with the aerosolized or chemtrail spraying. They're definitely doing terraforming and geoengineering to create an environment that's conducive to their new life forms. Hmm. Uh, an effort, you know, the terraforming. Uh, wow. Uh, I've heard other people and guests have said this, you know, the, the changing of the atmosphere, the soil, and the uh, life forms here on Earth is terraforming the, the globe for species or a, a old species, if you will. Um, many mm-hmm. talk about uh, Another question here from Matt. It says, in the Bible, Satan tempts Jesus by offering him all the claims are his to give. Jesus does not contest Satan's claim, but refuses to bow to him. Some have given claim that Satan manifests in the flesh form to powerful families such as the Rothschilds and the powers that be. If so, when did Satan get out of Yeah, it's not Satan that's in to my understanding of what I've read of their occult beliefs and who they're praying to. What we're looking at are, if you will, the seven fallen angels or perhaps one single entity, spiritual entity that resides trapped in Saturn as a prison planet. I know some other talk show host refers to this as the prison planet, but Saturn is the prison planet. So it isn't necessarily that Satan is trapped in, in, uh, in Saturn. But we do see, as I mentioned in this article in Revelation, uh, a star falls from the sky. Now, ostensibly, that is, the star is Lucifer falling from heaven or being kicked out of heaven. I think that we can assign that to Saturn. Anthony, if if I can uh, interject this question, and I think this is kind of a larger question to the previous one, and this is by Anne listening live out of the UK where it's late right now uh, wants to know uh, I, I'm okay she, she writes that she did not uh, get a chance to listen to all of last week's program with Mr. Patch please ask what is the deal with Saturn uh, I mean why Saturn mm-hmm. where did it come from What's the history behind it uh, for her not having a benefit of listening to last week? Sure. Well, last week we sort of took the components of Saturn and the northern pole of Saturn is a, quote, naturally occurring synchrotron particle accelerator, a huge version, larger than our planet, a large version of the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. If you look at the NASA video footage or the composite um, sequential photographs that have been taken of the Northern Pole, the clouds, energy clouds that are moving in opposite directions, contra-rotating clouds, these are energy clouds. These are synchrotron energies. These are particles accelerated in opposite directions, just like at CERN, and are colliding with one another creating Birkeland currents right through the core of the planet connecting to the southern pole. And you can see these um, helical, 
the, the end point, the end cross-section, if you will, of the helical Birkeland currents in the form of a spiral. And that spiral in the pole of Saturn is identical to the Norway spiral, which was generated by its synchrotron energies and its magnetic lines of force. Saturn itself has always figured into the mythology and the occult, and it has been utilized as a prison planet, and it is the breaking of the of the bonds, the the Birkeland current bonds within the planet that will release those en that entity or entities from that planet, and that's why it's worshipped all down through the ages, is because. It's contains the entities that the occult want to bring back to our dimension. And that's the big deal with CERN, or with Saturn. Okay, fantastic. And that was a good summation. I had uh, the opportunity to listen to last week, and and uh, I like the way you covered it. And folks, if you to listen to our last program with Mr. Patch, please do so to supplement what you're hearing right now. Uh, because it's it's really a lot of information to really get into. Now, um, uh, I got a question here, Joe. Unless you've got another one from David asking about the biometric biometrics and RFID. Will CERN, how will CERN play into the RFID slash biometric role uh, that uh, Christians can expect, mm -hmm. and you know that. The, that we're looking for is perhaps the mark of the beast. Yeah, I think towards the end of the last week we touched on this a little bit, and I, this is a great chance to clarify that. There's no need for an RFID chip. That's very old technology, and it's something to just set aside. What we have all been exposed to through aerosol Brain, GMO foods, just inhaling the atmosphere are nanoparticles. Nanoparticles in my books and in this article figure into the DNA that we talk about. I've oftentimes talked about third strand of DNA and four strand DNA. The short version, short answer is we already have residing within our bodies dormant nanoparticles that have been engineered and in presented to us for absorption or inhalation or ingestion such that when we receive an electromagnetic signal in the form of microwaves from geosynchronous satellites and cell phone towers, we will receive in our bodies an activation signal that will cause the replication to take place of these nanoparticles modify our DNA and will also, because of the DNA modification, change the way that we think, such as to the extent we will not even be aware that we have been changed. Now, we talked earlier about accepting Christ as your Savior and the power of the Holy Spirit, and the power in the name of Jesus Christ. It is my belief that we are shielded from that, that the Holy Spirit we speak of as the full armor of God. Well, in a physical sense, rather than just a theological sense, we do have armor protecting our DNA. Subject us to all the nanoparticles they want, and we will be immune from this process. So I hope that answers the question. Okay. Yeah. Um, a, a similar question from our Roger. He asks about DNA manipulation. If we accept DNA manipulation from entities offering us extended life, can the manipulation be reversed or have taken the mark of the beast? Yes, we've taken the mark of the beast. If we make the choice to not accept Christ as our Savior and not take on the Holy Spirit, then we've made the choice to take on the mark of the beast. And it's a one way of... ...the scripture 
a one-way process. Once we have been changed, just pre-flood, once we have changed our DNA, we no longer are written in the book of life, and God turns his face away from us. And then, I shouldn't say us, but those that choose not to accept Christ will not have that protection, and it's a one process. Once you're changed, that's it. Okay, and, and this is an issue that I, I've, I've really... Um... And I've seen people re- re- wrestle with this issue. We cannot be fooled into taking the mark of the beast. Isn't that correct? In other words, we we have to make a conscious decision to say, uh, "I will I will take this mark. I will pledge my allegiance to uh, you know the beast or the antichrist," as opposed to being tricked by this. So it's a it's a it's not a past activity, right? Right. It's our will. Okay. So, so okay. Yeah, I agree. We make a conscious decision. Okay. So the nanobots, all of this stuff, uh, you, know, the, you know, the things that are, uh, that were in general, in the, the uh, stuff that's really affecting our DNA, past, I mean, we're not asking for it. I mean, we're not sucking in a, you know, we're, we're not, uh, there's not a giant bong on the table and we're, in, you know, ingesting in this uh, modified, uh, uh, the modifier DNA. Um, um, how does that play in? In other words, it's latent in our bodies, but... Um, Will that just be a force multiplier for the mm-hmm. mark, or, or you know, again, what's it's changing the way we think? So, but I mean, if we're rent into kind of uh, intellectual it, 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 people without the make conscious decisions or informed choices, um, certainly God, God will understand. I mean. God is not going to allow that to happen, right? Uh, you know what? You know where I'm going with this. Certainly, I, yeah. I, I'll put it in this context: if you have been presented and you make a choice, either to reject the gospel or not, then you've made your choice. If you are capacity that doesn't allow for you to make that rational choice, then I think that certainly understands that and is not going to hold those types of people accountable. Back to, you know, the exposure to the gospel, you know, will it be preached to every corner of the planet? But more specifically to the mark of the beast, the mark of the beast, in my mind, in my context, is a sign. it signifies to the leader, powers that be, to the enforcers, who you are, a, a physical mark. But you have, prior to receiving that mark, you've made the choice. I'm either going to go with Satan, or I'm going to go with Christ. And if you've chosen to go with Satan, then you will be given that mark, because you've made that choice forced upon you. It's free will, but it's a visible mark that indicates I want my DNA to be changed. I want to live forever. I want all of the deceptive promises of no disease and longevity. And that's what will be presented as a great deception to people amongst other deceptions. This promise of no more cancer or you will be cured of cancer. Things will be promised to people. And if they believe that deception, then they'll be willing to have their DNA changed. Huh. All right. And that, that's so, uh, to me, this is really the epitome of evil. When you this uh, the, the group or... 
saying, well, we've got the key. We've got the cure for cancer. All you have to do is, and, and then, you know, worship uh, the beast and accept the mark. I mean, that's, or, hey, you hungry? Yeah. Have I got a deal for you? Mm-hmm. And, you know, so it's, yes, we have free will, and I believe that vision will not be an easy one, shall I say? I mean, it, it, it's it's not going to be easy for Christians to say no to the mark of the beast. I mean, think about this. if you've ever been a, a diabetic, for example. You know the insatiable thirst that you have when your blood sugar is so far out of line. It doesn't matter. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, you could you you would drink, you would you would drink the paint off the wall if you could. Think of a thirst that bad and uh, being offered well sure uh, here I can fix that here's the mark or the pain whatever. Uh, so, so it really I mean you know it's I just emphasis because I know it's not going to be well hey that's the mark of the beast I'm not going to take it and you know I'm going to continue to live casually and uh, comfortably that's not going to be the way yeah, and, you know, I think the thing we can emphasize is that people will not be necessarily tricked into taking the mark of the beast, but they will be tantalized. We talked about, you know, economic collapse and people starving and medications, etc., and they'll then be given the choice. Do you want access to the economic System. Do you want food and water and medication? Yes. Well, then take the mark. Cure. Take this vaccine or take this pill or physical mark on you. It doesn't need to be an RFID chip. And then you can have access to all of this. And therein lies the choice. Exactly. Uh, th- th- there's one other person that I'm going to turn over to you. Karen writes, uh, uh, do you see uh, this potential coming timeline-wise? So in other words, um, having to make that choice, Mr. Patch, in your estimation, understanding that we're looking at everything through a glass darkly, w- what's your time? Close? I think we're close. I'm not a date set. Again, I always sort of hedge my bets a little bit here, even though I'm not a betting man, but hedge in terms of the calendar that's presented through the Large Hadron Collider. But that said, my intuition of it and my study of their agenda and how things like Paul said yesterday are accelerating, 2016 has to be the time frame in which we see the economic collapse and the advent of the mark of the beast. Sometime in 2016, things cannot progress very much longer. And we alluded to talking about Paul's comment about the UN Agenda 21 and they're fixating on a date of 2030. You off the air that I think 2030 is a ruse. I think that's that's a mega number. Things are not going to exist the way they are now until near or at 2013. Everything is going to happen in rapid fashion because look at what's going on with Syria. We started the show talking about Syria and Russia attacking our friendly troops um, in Syria. What's going on with Israel and the possibility that Israel will get into launching nukes as a result of a chemical biological attack coming from Syria over the uh, Golan Heights and into Tel Aviv. So if we pay attention to, as Scripture says, Israel is the timepiece. If we pay attention to what's happening, as well as what's going on with CERN, even though they appear to be physically separated in their activities, the time frame is in lockstep. So Israel will tell us what's going to happen with the Large Hadron Collider 
and it will give us a, a, a touch point as to how near we are to seeing the portal opening and the mark of the beast and all the other agenda items. So I think 2016, we will definitely see the world turned on end. My question, no one else's question, my question, will Christians, the majority of Christians, realize understand what they're seeing? Uh, when they're observing well, Israel and the LHC, or just specifically the LHC, or the world in general? Well, I'll, I'll make it real simple. Will um, the Christians understand that they are, we are living in the end of end of days or living in the time period when we are going to um, experiencing the mark of the beast, if you will, or, or the run-up to it, not the run-up to, but the, um, Joe, help me out with that question, because I know, I know you know what I'm thinking here. Will we, will we recognize? For, let me make it real the simple. Scripture states, we didn't recognize the Antichrist. Well, uh, the mark of the beast first is deal with the mark of the beast. It says in the scripture that uh, every man, whether they're uh, rich or poor, free or slave, will have to take the mark of the beast uh, in order to buy or sell. So that is one um, indicator that we are. We know, um, you know, you are going to have to take a mark or take a, um, be, uh, accept or be initiated into a, a new society or you will be banned from society. You will not allow to be part of their um, community. Now, uh, the Antichrist mm -hmm. um, will be revealed. Uh, he goes into perdition, if I... Uh, Am I remembering correctly? Um, will we know who he is after that? Yes, but but before, I mean, I don't know. I, I guess Anthony, what I'm, what I'm really considering is is you know he, that that statement in the Bible, if it were possible, very likely will be deceived. Um, uh, to me, that that represents a delusion of such great magnitude, or a spiritual um, blindness so great that or combination of both that that even Christians uh, perhaps members of our audience perhaps uh, uh, people the closest to us won't recognize what's happening and that's my question if you want to mm -hmm. discuss that well to be very succinct in an answer I think that is why you and Joe myself Paul Tom Horn, all the way down the list, this small, small group of Christians, through their different types of messages, trying to warn even the Christians that there is that ability to be deceived. The way to counteract deception is knowledge. And so I think that you and I have been called forth to study, to investigate, and to present knowledge that is not presented in any other format or so that those that are exposed to our information better informed to head off that deception that would otherwise occur if you didn't have that knowledge. Okay. All right. Yeah, you know, I, I guess I, having grown up, when I did, I think back to the old Twilight Zone episode to um, to serve man. And I'm not sure how many people in the audience remember that or have seen it on repeats or reruns. But you know, yeah, uh, aliens from outer space space come in and they they offer this plan to to serve man. And of course, it's a benevolent sounding title of a book and. Yet uh, the book is actually a cookbook. Spoiler alert! But nonetheless, that's kind of, um, and they realize that when it's too late, the code breakers of the book. Really, it's too late when people are just you know running onto the ship and uh, spaceship for their vacation to a 
glorious new planet. But anyway, so that's kind of why I asked that question, I guess, to, to give a little bit of context to the question. Here, I have a, an interesting question here yeah. uh, from Dan. And she says, I saw a report on the following and would like to know what Mr. Patch can share, if anything. She says, love you, Mr. Patch, and, and God bless you. Um, there's an article, Babylon Falling. Sir identified as a secret entrance to subterranean CIA, CIA headquarters beneath Lake Geneva in yeah. Switzerland. You said that earlier. Yeah. Um, have hmm. you heard that? Nope. <laughs> okay. <laughs> How's that for a short? Uh, pretty succinct. Hey, we get, we actually have something you didn't know. That's pretty, that's pretty amazing about CERN, but, um, Okay, interesting. <laughs> I'll dig into it, though. I right. will go after it. We're going to hold you to that. Sure. Let's see. Any hmm. other rabbit holes? Let's see here. I'm going through a list. you got a list over there. Um, okay. Um, uh, this is a question. Craig... And let me read this here. Uh, isn't what Satan is offering or trying to just a proxy host for the departed spirits of the Nephilim? Even if they are successful, these spirits will not have the satisfaction of their senses as they had in their original bodies. They will still <clears throat> exist with the limitations that they currently have. Anything there? Yeah, okay. I would agree with that. Okay. Yes, they will be limited in their senses. They are the the spirit of the Nephilim are not seeking what they sought in the beginning, which was to be able to have the same emotions and and physical sensations that we experience as a human. Their purpose, as I said earlier, simply now to be a soldier, and they are coming back in various ranks and authorities to command their armies, just like we command our own armies. And that's their purpose now. It's the original time when they um, took on human form. Okay. All right. Let's uh, I, got a, I got a question here from Perry wanting to know. Um, I'm sifting through some. Um, I got a, a question go here. Go for it, because uh, I got a question a little bit harder. Um, a, a listener, or a, a author, Maria, uh, it's this, uh, can you please talk about symmetry, dance, opera, and movie? Yeah, uh, earlier we mentioned that symmetry is a choreographed ritual. It took place, it was actually filmed atop one of the detectors inside the Large Hadron Collider, and this was their telegraphing of a message, not only to communicate with the other side, as I said earlier, but to communicate to us as their victims and future victims. We've all heard that they have to present to us their agenda. They have to warn us, in other words. And the dance of symmetry was to show the interdimensional portal being opened, the influence of Satan upon man, the destruction, much like the statue of Shiva, the destruction, and then the empty playing field, what I call the clean for the planet, which is the white plane, the white playa that they show in the film. That clean sheet of paper, and from that, creating a new universe, a new heaven on earth. And that's what that whole movie really in a nutshell is about. It's about the destruction and then the rebirth of a new environment race. And you see the dark hand touching the white face and that is representing the passing of that ability from the dark side to the light side of that dark information from the other side so that that new and that new race can thrive. And that's what symmetry was telling us. They're coming, opening the portal, 
they will be successful, and they're celebrating it. Wow. Mr. Patch, we are just a few short minutes away from the end of the program. Well, let me toss this question from Perry in here, um, if, I, if I might. Yeah. Okay. Um, boy, I'll tell you, this is a difficult question, but... Uh, I'm even sure. You know what? I can't even. I I, I can't even articulate. <laughs> this fine. is so complex. Okay, there's like a two paragraph. I'm going to send we it. To Mr. Yeah. Patch, yeah. Mr. Patch, what other upcoming uh, interviews, if any, do you have scheduled uh, or uh, presentations or YouTube videos? Uh, anything upcoming? Well, the YouTube channel will have some new videos posted next week, but I have an interview that is. Coming up next week with John B. Wells on Caravan to Midnight. We don't have a date set for that yet. Um, my schedule's a little bit up in the air at this point, but by tomorrow I'll be able to on my website. Um, that's the only interview that I have accepted. I've accepted a lot of requests for blog talk, radio shows, and whatnot, and I just don't have the time, unfortunately a lot of interviews, but I greatly appreciate being able to be on your show, one of the most valuable venues and audiences out there. I am very selective in my interviews because I want to reach the largest audience with a limited amount of time because I do work a day job, and I would appreciate it if people believe in what I'm doing and want to support me that me in that regard to spend less time working in my day job and more on that I can bring to your audience for their benefit. Um, I'm not looking for or anything like that. It's just my goal is to do this full time so that I can be in a full time ministry and getting as much information out as rapidly as possible in the short time remaining. Amen, and, and we're behind, we're behind you one hundred percent. Yeah, uh, and we'll folks, promote the yeah. Wells interview. I'm sure that will be fantastic. John's a friend of ours, and uh, he's been on our show. Dad was on. Today. Yeah, I'll be on uh, Well, it'll be airing tonight. Uh, actually, at eleven o'clock, you can catch me on uh, JB Wells on here around the midnight. But but you're right, Mister Patch. Uh, you've got to you've got to limit your time at this moment. But l let's see if we can change that. We've got a very loyal listening audience and. And um, folks, uh, please support Mr. Patch's work if yes. you have benefited from it. It's only uh, uh, my goodness, you're, it's, you're a valuable asset. And, and really, spend some time watching the, the videos from Mr. Patch, and that will contextualize the information he has imparted with us tonight. Absolutely. And we thank you so much, Mr. Patch. We're going to keep you in our prayers. We'll be following your work, and we hope uh, to do this again soon. Sure, and I would appreciate coming back and uh, helping with any other questions you may have, and we'll do this again. You guys are fantastic. I appreciate that, and God bless everybody in the audience that's out there listening to this. And again, no fear. No Amen. fear is necessary. With that, and thanks for that. We're at the end of the program. AnthonyPatch.com is the website. Bookmark the your eye on it. We will be uh, promoting the upcoming interview with Mr. Patch and J.B. Wells. Uh, God bless each and every one of you for tuning in tonight. Thank you, Mr. Patch. Thank you, listening audience. Thank you, Todd and J.D., Eric. We'll be back tomorrow, Friday. From our new digs, John actually. Little. Yeah. Well, tomorrow. Stay safe. Have a good night.